John chapter 20. Last week, I was keeping my distance from most of you. Uh, if I got too close and you're not here today, I apologize. But uh, Sunday afternoon, I did my fevers. Well, I had fever on Sunday afternoon. I didn't have it Saturday. I didn't have it Sunday morning, so I felt okay in coming. But then Sunday afternoon, it, it did spike, and it got up to 101 during those few days. So sorry about that if I did breathe in your direction. But we, our bodies got to get back in fighting shape, don't they? So uh, we're going through all this. It's like I told others that it's like when Cindy first started teaching, we got everything. And it seemed like our bodies got in really good fighting shape. But I said over the last, uh, since July, we've been living in the classroom because we've had the Sedlacek family and homeschooling and all that going on at our house. So uh, they're, they're moving off to their own greener pastures. And we blame Drew for everything, don't we? <laughs> everything we can. He may have nothing to do with that, but we like to blame him anyway. John 20, verse 11. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said unto them, Because they've taken away the Lord, and I know not where they've laid him. When she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. And Jesus said unto her, Don't touch me, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and to your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. And that he had spoken these things unto her. This is a familiar portion of scripture around Easter time, isn't it? I hope you understand whether it's about Christmas or it's Easter or any other event. Uh, we need to look at it all year long. Uh, most of you know that we celebrate as the Protestant church, well, as the church. Uh, since uh, Jesus' resurrection, the church has uh, honored the first day of the week as the Sabbath because that's the day Jesus rose from the dead. We don't practice the Old Testament Sabbath. We practice the New Testament Sabbath. And so we're here today, and we celebrate every day, don't we? We must dwell here every day, contemplating the presence and the power of our risen Lord. And Jesus was getting them, those who had walked with him on earth, ready for this, ready for what you and I experience as Christians all the time. He was getting them ready. Our walk of faith, he was getting them ready for. Everything for which Jesus was preparing them, we are to be experiencing now. There, there is an essential embracing of our Lord that you and I have to understand. It's essential for full salvation for you being there, for you walking the streets of gold. If you will walk with him in glory, you have to walk with him on earth. If you are to embrace him there, you must embrace him here. And that's what Mary was about to do. She was about to embrace Jesus, obviously, because he said, don't touch me. She was moving to embrace him once she saw that it was Jesus there in the garden. But Jesus said, don't, don't. And notice the reason he gave. He said, don't touch me for I am not yet ascended to my father. I don't think she'd be able to hug him once he's ascended. 
very important message that Jesus was giving, given to Mary and to all of us. The heavenly father of Jesus, while he walked on this earth, while Jesus walked on this earth, can now be your father, as you notice what he said to Mary. But this essential embrace of our Lord cannot be done with the physical eye or with the physical touch or by our emotions. And the enemy of God and all of his demon forces will gladly provide any and every substitute for this embracing of, of Jesus. Because he seeks to deny us the one way that God has to get it done. If we're going to embrace him, if we're going to be with him forever, there's one way he must do it. Don't misunderstand. The physical was great. And the physical will be great and glorious. And the physical, when Jesus walked the earth, was absolutely necessary in establishing this one way that I'm talking about. And it's certainly going to be glorious in the future. But what God needed done for us could never, ever be done by the physical. And as Jesus moved on this earth in the physical, he was teaching the spiritual every step of the way. And there was another woman that moved to touch Jesus, you may remember. We're not turning to that place, but just want you to think about it and remember it. To touch the hem of his garment. It's in Matthew 9, 20, those of you who are taking notes. And different details are in Mark 5 and Luke 8. But she said, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. And Jesus turned to that woman and said, daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith has made you whole. At the time, her physical affliction was an issue of blood of some type that made her unclean. She could not uh, have the privileges that Jewish women would have as far as public worship and all of that. It would have made her unclean and unfit. The scriptures reveal that she had sought healing through doctors and through every potential cure. She had spent all of her money, if you put all of those places together and read the details, but then she came to Jesus, and she came in that great crowd, and this was a massive crowd, one of those kinds of crowds that will make you nervous because it's shoulder to shoulder, and you're just kind of shuffling your feet, like after getting off a ride at uh, Disney World or something, or maybe worse than that. So many pressing in to see Jesus, so many wanting to receive a miracle, so many had heard about him and were seeking their own miracle. Something was different about this woman. She touched the hem of his garment. And the disciples thought Jesus was crazy when he said, who touched me? Who touched you? Who hasn't touched you? You know, we're in this massive crowd and people are elbowing everybody and it's, it's crazy. And you want to know who touched you? They, they thought he was a little bit crazy at the moment. Who touched me? Everyone is touching me. But there was something different about this touch, so much so that Jesus turned to her and called her daughter, which was a great honor for the Lord to refer to as his daughter. And the Jewish people were told to wear white fringes with a string of blue. It was a reminder of the law of God, of God's message to them you can find that in Numbers 15, verses 38 and 39. It had to do with the tassels or the edges of their garment and what God told them to do. And the word for corners or the edges of the garment is the same for the eagle's wings in Scripture, the same exact word. In Exodus 19, 4, you've seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bared you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. It's the same image in Malachi 4, verses 1 through 2, speaking of the Messiah. The son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. The message of the Messiah was worn in the hem of the garment. It spoke of the priesthood of Jesus Christ. It spoke of the healing that is found in Jesus Christ. And in that great throng of people, a woman touched the physical symbol of Jesus' role as spiritual healer. 
And yes, she had a physical problem, and she wanted to be healed of her physical problem, but she touched him in a way that was symbolizing why he was there and what he was about. And she was healed physically, but it's a picture of, of more than physical healing. It's a picture of spiritual healing. We sing about it sometimes whenever we sing that song, Surely the Presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. In the midst of his children, the Lord said he would be there. It doesn't take very many. It can be just two or three. And I feel that same sweet spirit that I've felt so many times before. Surely I can say, I've been with the Lord. That song goes on to say, Surely the presence of the Lord is in there, this place. There's a holy hush around us as his glory fills this place. I've touched the hem of his garment. And my heart is overflowing with the fullness of his joy. I know without a doubt, I've been with the Lord. I've touched the hem of his garment. Again, that physical touch represented her touch by faith. And that physical healing is a picture of the spiritual healing and health he offers you and our world. And as Mary made a move to embrace Jesus there near the empty tomb, he said, don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended. And then you can touch me, is the implication. After I've ascended, you can touch me. And many of you are familiar with what happens next in John 20. But when you connect these things, the message is far more powerful than when you separate them. In John 20, read on, verse 19. In the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. When he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad. I can only imagine they saw the risen Lord. And then said Jesus unto them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had thus said this, he breathed on them. And he said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Notice what he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Remember from last week in Jesus' high priestly prayer, I've given them thy words. I have given them thy word. Notice from last week he said both of those things. I've given them your words. And then he said, I've given them your word. I've given them the truth that's derived from those holy words. And Jesus told his disciples in John 14, 16, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, listen, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you. And Jesus was with them at that time, and he shall be in you shall be in you. The world can't see me, but you can. Physical sight can't do it. Can't get it done. And then he goes on, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But you see me because I live. You shall live also. The world's looking at me right now. He was on the earth. He was walking around at the time when he spoke those words. He said, the world can see me right now, but there's coming this time where they won't be able to see me. But you will be able to see me. The world had seen Jesus. The world could hear with their ears. They could see with their eyes and feel with the physical touch. There were those little children that he brought up into his arms and blessed them with the physical touch that he gave them. 
so could the disciples. One could lay on his, his bosom and, and express how much they loved him. But Jesus said that was coming to an end. And all those physical confirming signs and all those overt miracles were coming to an end. The touching with the physical hand, the seeing with, with the physical eye would come to an end as far as experiencing Jesus. But they would have the spirit of truth. And through confirming signs, they would have the words of the Holy Scripture. And on the authority of the word... Sins would be remitted. That word means gone, cleansed, and forgiven. That's what Jesus was in reference to. Not at the whim of the disciples, not at the whim of the preacher, but by the power and authority of the word of God. And if you're forgiven, it better be by the power and the authority of the word of God that comes from the Holy Spirit that he breathed on them. And through him gave them his words and the word. And based on the word, I'm forgiven. Not based on my daddy saying I'm forgiven. My daddy happened to be my pastor. But it's not based on him saying, son, you're forgiven. But he said by the authority of the word of God, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. On the power and the authority of God's word, you're forgiven. Doesn't matter how you feel. It, it matters the facts by the authority of the word of God. He said, you forgive on earth, it's forgiven in heaven. You can be sure of that on the authority of the word of God. Find comfort in that. And through uh, worship leaders, you don't find that. It's the authority of the word. It's not through working up emotions. It's through hearing the word. Uh, it's not hearing stories of people that have died and gone to heaven. It's on the authority of the word of God. And fantastic stories of proof. It's not based on that. When the word is known, it's all the proof we need. It's all the proof I need. And prophecy books sell by the millions, not because they explain scripture, but because prophecy is used illegitimately to make God real to our senses instead of just explaining the scriptures to us. We seek to make God real to our senses. We make God real through the mysterious ritual of the church or tradition instead of truth by the invisible spirit of God and his word. The only move of God is, that's needed is brought through the inspired words of the Bible brought to life in the truth by the anointing of God's holy invisible spirit that you can't see. We've heard of revival in Asbury College and seminaries across the street. I've been there a few times because that's a good, used to be conservative Methodist school. Maybe God is stirring up some of the truths that used to bring Methodism to life and, and influence this nation in a powerful way. I hope it's a revival of the words of God and not the revival of emotion. That's what I'm praying for. And I don't know what it is. I hope it's a move of God. It may very well be. And we're warned in the prophecy of Holy Scripture that Jesus' coming will be preceded by the working of Satan. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 and 10, the working of Satan with all power and signs, and lying wonders. Right before Jesus comes, prophecy, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 10, says it will be after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The wonders that God used to bring about Holy Scripture were true wonders. They're going to be lying wonders supporting that which is not the truth. And it goes on, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. There's only one thing that will save us. It's God's truth, taught by his Holy Spirit. It's the only thing that's saving us. It's the only thing that will get you converted and in a relationship with Christ. It's the only thing that will sustain a relationship with Christ. 
anything that's anti-theology and anti-scripture and anti-word is of Satan. And we must fight against it with all of our being. In Matthew 24, 24, the great prophecy chapter, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if possible, they shall deceive the very elect. That means God's real people, God's great Christian people may be deceived because these miracles will be so great. How do, how do you keep from that happening? How do you keep deception from happening? It's the love of the truth. The love of the truth. It's the only thing that will protect anybody. It's the love of the truth. God's very best shall be deceived unless they touch the hem of his garment and are healed and touch it in the way that he has provided. And we are given the health of God's word when we touch him and him of his garment. We're made well. We're made whole. And Psalm 119, 9 says, Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? By take, taking heed according to thy word. Whatever is remitted on earth is remitted in heaven by the power of the word of God. And it's by the power of the word of God that I touch the hem of his garment. It is by the power and wonder of the word of God that I embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. And all other ways are illegitimate and are of Satan and will destroy. We must embrace him by his word and by truth and not by signs and wonders. Y'all know when Jesus was working signs and wonders to confirm that he was the true Messiah, and then the disciples did it to confirm the words they were preaching so we could have them. You know what he said? <sighs> Why does this generation seek after a sign? Why does this generation need some move of God or some miracle when the word of God taught by his Holy Spirit is sufficient? It's sufficient. It's all we need. Oh, I'd like for us to sing.